not so many fearsome formula formulae coming up, so uh, it'll be a bit easier. So we're now going on to the, the non-parametric test. And the T test that we already looked at was a parametric test. Is uh, It should be, but let me. Is that better? Is it on or off now? You have to press for it to be on. Yes, I. Now, now, now. Is it? Yes. I can't hear anything here. Okay. okay. That's all right. Is it? That's all right. Fine. right. Okay. So we're going on now to look at a non-parametric test, which is the equivalent of the t-test for independence afterwards, but on a non-parametric basis. Okay. So if you've got data which, for some reason, do not conform to the requirements of the t-test, then this is an alternative that you can use. So, level of measurement of data. They must be at least ordinal. It's normally used for ordinal data. Though, of course, you can use it for interval or ratio data. Remember that you're not forced to use a parametric test when you've got interval or ratio data. It can be used for inter interval or ratio data or for ordinal data, this particular test. And you may find occasions on which you've got interval or ratio data, but the conditions for the t-test simply aren't met. The other conditions, in which case you can use that with. But the samples must be independent. This is a test for independent samples, not for repeated measures kinds of design. And although the, um, the maths behind the non-parametric statistics are not um, perhaps quite so accessible as the ones for the t-test, um, I will at least try and show you the rationale behind the test so that you can see what's happening. If you were doing this test by hand rather than by computer, what you would do is to take both groups together, imagine we've got two groups of scores as usual, take both groups together and rank the whole set of data. Right? So not each individual group, but the two groups lumped together. So you rank them from smallest to biggest. Okay. Now, if you did that, you would expect, wouldn't you, that if there's no difference between the groups, if the two groups really are very similar, you'd expect high and low ranks to be distributed equally between the groups, wouldn't you? Because if you had all high ranks in one group and all low ranks in the other group, there would obviously be big differences between the groups. What you'd expect is a mixture of ranks in each, in the two groups. You'd expect roughly the same numbers of high ranks in the two groups and low ranks in the two groups. And that's what the SPSS Man Whitney program does. It does these rankings and then it finds what the sums of the ranks are for each group. Now, if there's no difference between the groups, between the mediums of the groups, you'd expect those sums of ranks to be roughly equal, wouldn't you? If the rank sums are very unequal, it means you've got a lot of high ranks in one group and a lot of low ranks in the other group. So it calculates the rank sums for the two groups and compares them, and effectively what it's doing is testing for the significance of the difference between medians here. Medians because you've got ordinal data which has been ranked. So, how do you do it? Of course, SPSS does it for you. The test statistic in this case is called U for some reason that I don't know, certainly. Presumably Mr. Mann or Ms. Whitney uh, actually called it U at the time. 
And it's a fairly simple kind of calculation. You take the two sample sizes and the two rank sums, and you simply insert them into these equations. So the top one tells you to multiply the two sample sizes together and add n1 times n1 minus 1 all over 2, and then to subtract the rank sum for group 1. You could then calculate the, the u2 value by um, putting the values for uh, group 2 in that top equation. But it's easier to do it using the simpler equation at the bottom. Uh, so n1, n2 minus the u1 that we've just calculated. So that's what SPSS will do for you. We'll cal calculate those things. And then the final test statistic is the smaller of those two values. Okay, so whichever of u1 for group 1 and u2 for group 2 is smaller is taken as the value, the final value of the test statistic u. And then that, of course, is tested against the tables for u to find what the critical values are for particular significance levels, just like any other test. So let's look at a, an example to illustrate that. This time we've got some acceptability ratings for an English sentence provided by two sets of informants with different native languages. So we're trying to find out whether um, the, your native language influences the degree to which you find particular kinds of uh, sentence acceptable or not. You'd probably actually have to um, give more, rather more information than that, you know, acceptable in a particular kind of writing or now, I think the data are clearly ordinal here because acceptability <coughs> is something that we can't easily measure on a scale of equal intervals. If I ask you to uh, rate a sentence for acceptability between 1 and 10 or something, if you give me a rating of 8, that doesn't mean you think that sentence is exactly twice as acceptable as one to which you would give a 4. Yeah. So it's ordinal data that you can rank but it's not interval ratio data. And we want to test, let's say, that uh, whether there's a significant difference between the two groups without actually predicting the direction. If we could have done a directional test, just for examples, saying I've done it this way. So here are the data. Does can you, can you tell anything from that data? Does it seem to you that one group um, does have higher acceptability ratings than on average than the other? Yeah, and group two does look rather higher, doesn't it? So we should be expecting perhaps a significant result here, but our experience with the t-test has told us that just inspecting the data often isn't enough. We need to go on and do the test, but it does look Hopeful. So how does the data file look for input to SPSS? Well, it looks exactly like the t-test input looked. Remember that SPS requires you to put all the data from one particular case on one line. So once more, we have a score for each particular one, and we have a group to which that particular score belongs. So we need to tell it in the variable view that we have two variables, one called score and one called group, um, that group is a grouping variable. So we select the analyze button as usual, but then non-parametric without the extra n. See there's another spelling mistake here. Non-parametric test and then two independent samples. That, that's how you <coughs> do it in SVSS. It gives you the, the choice of various non-parametric tests. And the one you clearly want here is two independent samples, because that's what we've got, isn't it? Two samples, which are independent groups. 
And just as we did with the t-test, we can select score as the test variable and group as the grouping variable. And we define the groups as being coded as group 1 and group 2. So it's just like the t-test, really, the way that we put it into the computer. I will choose my group. So that's what we get out of SPSS initially. Notice that it's giving the number in each group, which doesn't have to be equal still. It gives the mean rank for that group, and it gives the sum of ranks. So in fact, the N column times the mean rank column should equal the sum of ranks column, shouldn't it? If the mean rank is 12.8 and there are 10 of them, then the sum of ranks has to be 10, 10 times 12. Okay. So we see that the mean rank, and indeed the sum of ranks, for group 2 is considerably higher than it was for group 1. That's what we would expect given our inspection of the original data. So the mean rank for group 2 is much bigger than for group 1. And then SPSS gives you a table which gives you the actual value of the statistic. Now again, it seems to be giving somewhat too much information here. It's a little confusing, it seems to me, but it always seems to give you more information than you really wanted. The important thing here is the Man Whitney U line with a score of 17. It also gives you something called Wilcoxon's W, and notice that that actually is the sum of ranks for, for group one for some reason. But we don't need to worry about that. Z will come in later on, but let's just focus on the Man Whitney U for now. And it again gives two different significance levels here, and again doesn't explain um, what the difference is between them, which again is, is not particularly useful, it seems to me. It calculates something called an asymptotic significance, and it gives an exact significance. Fortunately, these are much the same. We can uh, get the same result from both here. So what have we got here? Have we got a, a significant result, would you say, or, or is it not? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How would you report it? You could obviously report it as, uh, let's take the two-tailed significance, since that's what we really want. Um, you can report it as P equals 0.018. If you were doing it in the conventional kind of way, with the different bands of probability, how would you then um, select this? P You know the one where, where they can be smaller than 0.5, smaller than 0.1, smaller than 0.01 and so on. So how would you how would you say this? Smaller than 0.5. Yeah, 0.05. Yeah, smaller than 0.05. It's bigger than 0.01 but it's smaller than 0.05. So you put P and then the sign for less than, but then 0.05, if you were doing it that way. Or you could simply quote the exact significance level as 0.05. And so we do have a significant difference between the groups, as we suspected we might. No, no, it's not. Because remember that what, what you, if you're doing this test manually, or a computer does, is first of all to replace the original scores by the ranks of those scores. Right? So it's not dealing with the figures I gave you in the table, yeah. but with the rankings of those figures. So that the mean is the mean of those ranks, not the mean of the original figures. 
Is, is there a problem with the idea well, of random scores? I didn't understand why the mean rank is 12 point something when the figures are lower than that. The highest is 9, for example. Okay, let's, let's go back here. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which figures? So, the, the highest the highest figure... Those are rankings, yeah? No, they're not. No, they're no, they're no. Big, they're These not. are the actual score, the, the actual scores, the actual ratings. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, they're so ratings, that's right. They're ratings. ratings. Yeah. yeah, but they're not numerical. I mean, they're ordinal. They're ordinal, yeah. yes. They, they look like numbers, so, okay. but, but the they're numbers, ordinal. But they're ordinal. Yeah. Okay. okay, so the first thing that the computer does is to rank those in order. So it says, what's the smallest one? A four. Yeah. yeah? So I'm going to give that rank one. Right? Okay, yes. Yeah, that has rank one. Yeah, that's what I must have missed Right. But then, how do you explain that number 12 doesn't sound because when you've done the rankings, there's, there's nine in one group and ten in the other, I think. So, yeah. so the, the top rank has got to be a 19, hasn't it? The highest figure, which is a nine here, has to have rank 19. Why? Because there are 19 pieces of data here. Yeah. So, so you have you've got different ranks. Yeah, so you've, got, so you've got 19 seven. figures right. here in this table, 19 figures, right? Ah, but then they get repeated, so if there's two fours... Ah, yes. Now, that, that's a question we haven't answered yet, but oh. I will now, if you like. But the principle is that you've got 19 figures here, so if you arrange them in a line, mm -hmm. and then rearrange them in order, yeah. you could then assign ranks. And then if you right? get three sevens... Then you one, assign each the... Each one gets a rank. Yes. Mm -hmm. You assign the average of the ranks they would have had if they'd been different. Okay. You see? So let's, let's just do it. The bottom is a 4, isn't it? The, the, lowest, the lowest figure here is a 4. Mm -hmm. So we assign a rank of 1 to that. Now the next biggest figure is a 5, but there are 1, 2, 3 of those. There are 3 fives. If those had been different, then they would have had ranks 2, 3 and 4. So you give them all rank 3 which is the average of 2, 3, and 4, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So each of those has a 3. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, the computer does this because we're dealing with ordinal. It does this because we are dealing with ordinal data. The man with me, you just <coughs> works on an ordinal scale. Yeah, there, there wouldn't be any sense in making, uh, working out a mean of that. Because no, they're not numerical. that's so right. So we have to translate it into something that Indeed. is... Workable. Indeed. Right. We translate it into ranks. That's right. And then we get, then ranks are, of course, um, on a, yeah, but ranks are, are actually yeah. interval yeah. Yeah, ratio. Okay. Okay. And then you can work out the and mean of that and that will make ranks. some kind of sense. Yeah. Yeah. But do you see now why the top rank has to be 19? Yeah. That figure 9 there, when you... Well, 19 or... The mean of... Or the, or the mean, if there were two nines... If there were two nines... Then the, it would have been the mean of whatever they could have Whatever they would have been. Yes, yeah. it would have been 18.5 yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that 12 in the, in the table, I mean, just some, yes, by looking we, at it, doesn't really mean anything. We, we would need to translate it back into the, the rating. Yeah, and you, for us to realize, well, were there more sevens or sixes or fives? Yes, and you, you couldn't actually translate the ranks back into the gradings uh -huh. precisely, yeah. I don't think. But, okay, so um, we, we don't get an idea, really, of no, what, what you, the mean is. No, no, because you don't need that. If you were going to calculate anything to do with central tendency, it would be better to calculate a median, median for each group. You can do it if you like, roughly. So, but um, I might, I might want to know how many sevens there were. Yeah, but you've got your original data. Okay. You know, you get it from that. Get it from that. Mm -hmm. okay. But if you were going to, to calculate um, some kind of measure of central tendency, so that you could compare the two groups, yeah. it would make sense to calculate the median for group one mm -hmm. and the median for group two, and compare those. Okay. Yeah. That's effectively that what this test is doing. Do you want do you want us to calculate the median for one of these groups or are you quite happy?
Okay, so we know now that there's a statistically significant difference between the groups, but we don't know whether the actual effect size is, is big or not. Remember this important difference between the uh, test being able to show you that there is a difference between the, in this case, the medians of the populations, but it doesn't give you an idea of how big or important the size of the effect is. For that, you need to do a different calculation. You remember that when we had that table of test statistics, one of the things it gave was something called Z. Now, Z is a statistic which is related specifically to the normal curve. Z statistics are to do with normal curve statistics. And don't ask me how, because I don't know, but it converts the U value. Well, I do. I have got a. I think I've got a formula for it in my book, but I can't remember it offhand. It converts the U value into a Z value, and you then use that in the calculation of the effect size. Back to Andy Field's book again. It's quite an easy one this time. Remember, the effect size is usually called R. In this case, it's the value of Z which SPSS gives you, divided by the square root of the number of observations. Total number of observations, that is 19 in this case. So, we had 2.372. That was the value of Z, divided by the root of 19. I've missed the sign out because the sign doesn't really matter. What we're after is the size of the effect here, and it's 0.54. Now, if you remember, with these R values for effect size, 0.1 was a small effect, 0.3 was a medium effect, 0.5 was a large effect. So, what we've got here is actually a large effect. So, not only is this a statistically significant result, the actual size of the effect that you're observing is appreciable, this is quite large. Is that okay? You, you really don't need to know exactly how U is calculated, but I hate just slapping formulae in front of people and saying that's what you use. You know, if you can tell people a little bit about the rationale behind the test, I think they're more likely to have confidence that it's not just a bit of uh, a bit of wizardry, even if you then forget about the, the actual rationale behind it. The important things that you've got to remember are what can I use a man Whitney test for? When should I use it? As opposed, for example, to a T test. What things have to be right? for me to use a man Whitney test. The, the answer there being at least ordinal data, so ordinal integral ratio data, not nominal, and <coughs> that you've got independent groups. <coughs> okay, now, earlier on... Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Could you maybe sort of briefly say how you would report this result? Um, yeah, sure, in sure. Um, example. You would report it much as you did um, for the t-test, except that here we're not dealing with, with um, df, with the degrees of freedom. So you'd say something like u equals, um, u equals 17, or 17 plus or whatever, P equals 0.018, or P is smaller than 0.05, which you prefer. And then you'd say, and as far as the effect size is concerned, R equals 0.54. And then you'd interpret that as being 
a large effect size. Okay, now we've dealt so far only with two groups. Excuse me, yes. so the large effect size is uh, sorry, well, large, then would need a bigger sample. Is no, no. What, what this means is that as well as being statistically, well, I can't say that here, <laughs> statistically significant. And I'm not, I didn't have anything to drink in here. <laughs> well, okay, um, yeah, it, as well as being statistically significant, it's also a real, real world large effect. We've not only shown that there is a difference between the population and the influence. That's what the statistical test tells you. There is a difference. But it doesn't tell you how large the effect is. It just says it's large enough for me to detect it. Right? So you need an effect size. And you calculate the figure for R. And ours turned out at 0.54. And we know that anything over 0.5 can be regarded as a large effect size. So we know that we've got something real and important here that's, that's worth looking at. Not just some kind of artifact of the method that we've used. So no, we don't really need to go on and do it with uh, a, bigger, uh, a bigger set of groups. If we did, we'd probably get even higher significance levels. Possibly a bigger effect size. Okay, now, average, tests for difference of, of averages for more than two groups. I would have loved to be able to do this in detail with you, but there just isn't time in eight hours. You know, I, I do a 20-hour version of this course as well, and there I do go into all this stuff. But, um, Constantino will be dealing with some of it with you in, in his classes. So we've got another table here showing you, if you've got more than two groups, what tests do you use? Now, let's think about t-tests again for a moment. T-tests were only for two groups, weren't they? Let's imagine that we've, again, just for sake of, sake of it being easy, let's, let's think about groups of students and language tests and so on. Um, you might have a, a group, four groups of students from different language backgrounds. Okay, it was, you know, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and Hungarian, I think I said earlier on. And you may have given them um, a test of some kind, and you want to find out whether there are any significant differences across the means of the four groups. So we've got four groups now, rather than just two. In that case, you should not, you, you can't use a t-test on all four groups at once, it only accept two groups at once. But what sometimes people do is to do t-tests on pairs of groups. And in fact, I, I didn't pick this up in the initial edition of my, my book, but on the web version it is there. You should not do that because by doing that, you actually um, have a rather different chance of getting statistical significance um, from the real one. You know, you, something is distorted there in, in, the, in the mathematics or the static work. So you're advised always not to do pairwise t-tests. What you need is something called analysis of variance, or ANOVA. And that's only if you've got ratio or interval data and independent groups. So ANOVA is the equivalent of the t-test for more than two groups. The equivalent of the independent t-test for more than two groups. By the way, I mean, remember the initial table that we had um, showed you tests for repeated measures as well, didn't it? I haven't been able to go into those with you because there hasn't been time. But there is a t-test for repeated measures as well, as you saw in that table, which we haven't been able to, to go through. Okay. What happens if your data are ordinal? 
then you can't use a parametric test, you have to use a non-parametric one, and the test that you should look up in this case is the Kruskal Wallace test, um, which again we don't have time to go through. If you've got a repeated measures design and ratio or interval data, then there is a special version of analysis of variance for repeated measures. And you can use that. And if you've got ordinal data, there's something which is usually called Friedman's ANOVA, though calling it ANOVA seems to me to be a bit misleading because ANOVA is only supposed to be for ratio or interval data, but it's often called this. The Friedman test is the one to use. And in all these cases, the basic principles that operate are just the same as the other tests that we've discussed. So armed with what you know about other tests, you could go and, and look at these. The, the thing is that once you get three or more groups, the statistics gets more complicated, obviously. And so it's perfectly possible to show how analysis of variance works, and if you can get hold of my so-called downloadable book, then you can have a look at this. Someone told me in the interval um, that it was no longer downloadable. Uh, has anyone tried, apart from the people I've been talking to, has anyone tried to download any of the chapters from, from my book as well? No. Because I'm going to have to look into this. If, when it was put on the net, which was some years ago by the University of Western England, um, the West of England, I think it is, it was agreed that it would be made available, and the copyright is mine, and has been mine for a long time, so I'm perfectly free to, to, to do that. So I don't know whether they've changed the system in such a way that you can read it online, but you can't download it. Um, so I'll get in touch with them again and see if that can be corrupted. I tried to download it uh, six months ago, more or less, when you wrote to, yeah. to me, and I said, you couldn't, you couldn't download it? No, I could read it online, but not. Right, well I'll try and find out why this is. There's obviously some reason for it, and one of you I think suggested that it, it might be that uh, the, the site will get more hits uh, through people reading it than by just downloading it one off and then reading it at home. But I'm surprised, well, they haven't told me anything about this, so maybe different people are in charge now and just haven't let me know. I'm sorry about that. Um, i trying to think of other ways of doing it. I suppose I could upload it to one of the sites that we were talking about last time the other day and make it freely available as a possibility. Or I could now probably put it on, I've got a, a web page in Swansea and also there'll be a Scimitar web page. So I could um, negotiate with UWE to, well, out of courtesy, so that I could do that, hang it there. I'll look into it anyway. Uh, but at least you're able to read it online, uh, which is a nuisance, but you know, it's better than nothing for now. But if you want to look at ANOVA, there's a simple ANOVA there. Um, that book really tries to make things as simple as possible. And in fact, ANOVA can get really complicated. Because not only can you have simple designs, like my four groups of students, there all you're interested in is, do the four groups have equal enough means to, to say that they're not different, they're not from different populations. But you can have things called factorial designs, where you're looking at more than one variable at a time. I think you were talking about these yesterday. Um, so, for example, you might have uh, male and female students from four different backgrounds. And you might be interested in the effect of language background and gender, and any interaction there may be between language, background, and gender. Mm -hmm. right? And ANOVA allows you to do that, but obviously the statistics are rather more complicated. So you know, I can deal with that in a 20 hour course, but I can't deal with it here. Anyway, you now know what to look for in cases where you've got more than two groups. I'm actually going to go on now to correlation. Because this is a technique that you may well find you need. I understand Constantino has talked about this a bit, but not all that much. So um, maybe you can um, hold on.
before she took the account. So what is correlation? Well, it's to do with the relationships between two or sometimes more variables. So you've got two different variables, you want to know whether high values of one go with high values of another, for example. So we're trying to answer questions of this kind. Do high values of variable x go with high values of variable y? Or perhaps high values of x go with low values of y? Or maybe there's a complex relationship. Maybe there's a curved relationship between the two rather than a straight line relationship. Or maybe there's no relationship at all between the two. And this is the sort of thing that correlation analysis will tell you. And an interesting and um, useful way of showing correlation visually is to do something called a scatter plot. A scatter plot has the values of one variable on the horizontal axis, left to right, and the corresponding values of the other variable up the vertical axis. Right? So each point there. So if we're looking at two different variables, each, each scored like that, then you might have something like that as a point, and that would mean that this particular person or thing that you're looking at has a score of 13 on the x variable and a score of 5 on the y variable. Right? And so and the scatter plot has little x's dotted all over that space. And if there's perfect correlation, what you're going to get is a straight line through the points. That's if the correlation is positive. If high values of x go with high values of y, you go, your line's going to go up, isn't it? But if high values of x go with low values of y, it's going to go in the opposite direction. That's a negative correlation. Okay, so if the correlation is positive, the graph slopes upwards. If it's negative, then the graph slopes downwards. Now clearly, while it should be pretty clear, I think, it's only sensible to use scatter plots for interval or ratio data, because we're treating these as real numbers, aren't we? Numbers that are uh, represent a variable that's measured uh, on a scale with equal intervals. Here's an example. So, there are marks of up to 20 on two different tests, a comprehension test and a translation test, for 10 foreign language learners. And there are your data. So, you've got 10 learners in the first column, and learner 1 scores 17 on comprehension and 12 on translation, and so on at the table. What we want to know is, do high scores on the comprehension test tend to go with high scores on the translation test? Or maybe people who are good at comprehension are not good at translation. Maybe it's an inverse or negative correlation. Scatter plots can be drawn with SPSS. There's a nice facility in SPSS under the Graphs tab called Chart Builder. And this allows you to do things like dragging different kinds of graph in and then um, telling it where the data are and it plots the data for you in the graph. So what we need here is the scatter or dot option. So we drag the scatter plot graphic uh, from a sort of uh, palette of uh, possibilities by the side into the drawing canvas. And then we tell it that the horizontal axis is going to be the comprehension variable and the vertical axis the translation variable. It could have been done the other way around, it doesn't matter. 
and we can give the plot a title that allows you to do that too. And for the data that I've given you, that's what you get. Okay, so it's, it's not a perfect straight line by any means, but you can see a trend, I think. You can see a trend. Higher values of translation do tend to go with higher values of comprehension. It vaguely slopes upwards. Okay? And that's a good thing to do. If, you, if you're looking at a correlation, the first thing I would do would be to draw a scatter plot to give you a visual idea of how things are. Rather as I would always suggest drawing things like histograms and so on to represent the descriptive statistical side of the data, the uh, distributions. <coughs> so how do I interpret that? Well, correlation is by no means perfect, but there is uh, an overall trend such that low values of one variable go with low values of the other, and so on. But that's not much good to us if we don't know whether that trend is a significant one or not. In order to know whether that's a significant, a statistically significant correlation, we need to do a test, a correlation test. What we do is calculate what's called a correlation coefficient for the data. And there are two main kinds of correlation, well, there are more actually, but two that I'm going to talk about with you, of correlation coefficient. And it depends on the level of measurement of your data. If you have ratio or, order, uh, ratio or interval data, measured on scales with equal intervals, then you can use the Pearson correlation coefficient. And that's the one that you'll find most frequently in anything that looks at correlation. On the other hand, if you've got ordinal data, then there's another correlation coefficient called Spearman, which is useful. Although I haven't put it on the, in, in the slides, there is a third one, or Kendall's TAU, T -A -U, or TAU, or however it's pronounced, which is also for ordinal data, and is better under certain circumstances. It's better if you've got lots of tied ranks in your, in your groups, and so on. So you might just be aware that there is another non-parametric correlation coefficient called Kendall. So what do you do if you've got one variable that's ordinal and the other one's ratio or interval? Well, then you can convert the ratio or interval values to a set of ranks first. You can do what we did with Man Whitney, effectively, and replace the original values by their ranks. And then you can proceed as if it was a normal um, now, another of my famous warnings, though not with jiggly jumping type this time, but there is a bit of red here. This is really an important point to, to remember. The correlation between two things does not necessarily imply a causal relationship. So just because two things turn out to be significantly correlated, you should not assume that one causes the other. Okay? For that, you need additional evidence of one sort or another. Okay? So um, you know you might find that um, eating lots of um, I don't know mackerel and salmon and stuff. Um, correlates positively with longevity, but you shouldn't then assume that because somebody has um, lived for, to the age of 97, it's necessarily because they've been eating lots of um, oily fish. Okay, same same with language too. So that's something a warning that's sometimes not heeded. People do 
slip in these ideas of causality in their leadership abilities. So let's look at the Pearson correlation coefficient first of all. And I'll again try to show you the rationale behind it and how it's calculated, but then you can let SPSS take over the hard work. So let's say that we're studying two variables, let's call them x and y, and we've got n pairs of data. Notice that for correlation, what we're dealing with is pairs of data, isn't it? It's a score of a particular person, say, on each of two tests. So we've got pair data. Now, any particular score on either of these variables can be expressed as something that statisticians call a standard score. And to do that, you look at the difference between the score itself and the mean of that variable, but then you express that in terms of multiples of the standard deviation. So, algebraically, what you've got is this. So in the left-hand one for variable x, I've taken a particular value of x, in our case it will be a particular score of one student on one of the tests. Right? And from that I take the mean score of all the students on that particular test. And then I divide the result by the standard deviation for that group. And that gives me the so-called standard score. And I do that for both the x variable and the y variable. And then the correlation coefficient is calculated by multiplying together the z and y values of z for each point, for each data point, adding them all up and dividing by the famous n minus 1 that we've met before where n is the number of pairs. So that's how, actually how it's calculated. You can do it in SPSS by choosing Analyze and then Correlate. There's a special section in the analysis uh, menu for correlation. And this is what we call a bivariate uh, correlation because we're dealing with two variables. Right? We can do correlations involving more. And then we select the Pearson test. There's a little button that you can um, click on uh, to do the Pearson test. We have to tell it what the variables are. So we drag comp and trans across as the variables. Now, our alternative hypothesis here is going to be that there simply is correlation. We're not predicting whether it's going to be positive or negative. So we'll need a non-directional kind of test, or a two-tailed test. And there is the result that you're given by SPSS. Notice that it gives you the same results twice, because it tells you, first of all, how um, group one is correlated with group two, and then it tells you all over again how group two is correlated with group one, and of course they're the same. Seems a bit silly, but it does it. The important thing is the value of the significance, the value of the correlation coefficient and its significance. So the correlation coefficient turns out at 0 0.831. 0 0.831 is a pretty high um, correlation, but how significant that is depends on the number of pairs that we've looked at. But it tells us that the significance value is 0 0.003. So how might you report this then? Either P equals 0 0.003 or P is smaller than 0 0.05. Why 05? You can go further than that. 0 0.01. Yeah, it's smaller than 0.01, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But not as small as 0.01. Okay, so, uh, and it tells you, you notice it's given it two stars because it's significant at the 0.01 level. Remember I said that one star often meant significant at the 05 level, 
and two stars means significant here, one. Okay. And since the coefficient is positive, what we have is positive correlation, as we saw from the scatter plot. If that had been uh, a slope which went down like that, it, had, it would have turned out as something like minus 0.83.40. So the sign is important here because it tells you the direction, positive or negative, of the correlation. What about effect sizes? We know we've got a statistically significant result. Now effect sizes are easy for correlations because the value of R, the correlation coefficient, is in this case itself a measure of effect size. So we can simply quote the correlation coefficient as being a measure of that. But do you remember the, um, the time when we also calculated R squared? Because R squared told us what percentage or fraction of the variance in the data was accounted for by the factor which differentiates the groups. And R squared gives you the same here. So R squared is 0.831 squared, which is 0.69. So that means that of all the variability between the two groups, 69% of it is shared between the two groups. But the whole variability in the whole lot of data, 69% of that is shared by the two groups. So it's a fairly high proportion that we've accounted for by means of this particular effect. Are you okay with that? Have you got the idea behind correlation and how to calculate it? It's, it's a bit simpler, really, isn't it, than um, some of the other stuff we've done. So what about Spearman? Well, it's very similar. I'll just go through a quick example with you. Um, it's a non-parametric test based on ranking, as you'd expect, for use of ordinal data. Again, just like man with me, you take the set of n scores, right? You've got pair, n, n pairs of scores here. And you rank them, first of all, on the first variable, from the smallest to the largest. So the comprehension test, for example, you rank them from smallest to largest. And then you do the same for the scores on the other variable. So you rank the translation scores from smallest to largest. And you remember what we do with ties. This is what you, Teresa, were talking about. Um, if there are ties, when there are several values with the same rank, then you take the average of the ranks they would have occupied if they'd been different. And then the test effectively compares the ranks on the two sets of scores by looking at the differences between the pairs of ranks. So you've got one lot of ranks for the comprehension and one for the translation. It looks across the rows and looks at the differences between the ranks. And that's the formula for the coefficient itself. The coefficient is normally given as the Greek <coughs> lowercase letter rho, and to find it you need the difference between the ranks for each pair, d, you square it, multiply it by 6, and then divide it by uh, the thing on the bottom line. So all you need is the difference between each pair of ranks and the sample size. And of course, all this is done by SPSS. And as usual, it says, OK, what's the value of the test statistic? But uh, I need to know how significant that is. So it calculates from tables the probability of obtaining that value, even if the null hypothesis is true. Exactly the same rationale as all the other testing we've done. So here's another example. 
Coherence ratings of scores, uh, scores out of 10 for coherence ratings of eight texts with two different assessors. What we want to know is whether the two assessors agree highly. And to do that, we can calculate whether there is a correla significant correlation between the rankings, but not, sorry, the coherence ratings that one uh, assessor gives and the ratings that the other assessor gives for the same text. And there are the data. So you have the eight texts. For text number one, you've got assessor one gives it a four, assessor two gives it a six, and so on down the table. We want to know whether the two assessors tend to give high ratings to the same texts and low ratings to the same texts. Okay? You see, for example, that text number two is given a seven and an eight, and text number eight is given an eight and a nine. So that makes it look fairly similar, but the others are not quite so, so similar. So what does the data file look like? Now, this is a bit different, isn't it? It's different in that a case now, remember a case has to occupy a line. A case is now a pair of values. Here, and also in repeated measures kinds of um, design, we're looking not at individual values, but at pairs of values. Because the test has to compare the ranks of the two values. So, a pair has to go in a line. So we have eight lines corresponding to each of the eight texts. And in the first column, we have assessor one's scores for each text. And in the second column, we have assessor two's scores for each text. So what the uh, program will be doing is uh, replacing these by ranks and then looking at the differences between ranks. Procedure is exactly the same as for Pearson, except that we choose the Spearman one rather than Pearson. It gives us exactly the same kind of table as output, and does it twice. Correlation coefficient is even higher this time than it was last time, 0.929. Notice that it flags that correlation as being significant at the 0.01. Uh, level, it, it doesn't tend to give you any more, uh, any higher significances than that, but you could legitimately report this as P equals 0.001, or even P is smaller than or equal to 0.001. So it's, it's very highly significant. Oops. Okay. Nothing very startling there. It's exactly the same, really, as, as Pearson, except that it's got a different rationale, a different way of calculating it. But operationally, it's very similar. I just wanted to, measure, to mention something called log-linear analysis. Now, I'm not going to go into it at all, but it can be very useful. No, sorry. Sorry, sorry, I've skipped. I've skipped a kind Sorry. I went to the end of the file. It's better to do that after consequence. Because we didn't do the effect size, did we? Okay, back to back to Spearman. The as usual, the square of the correlation coefficient tells us how much of the variation the two variables share. So how much of the variability in the whole lot of data is actually explained by the difference between comprehension and translation. So we square 0.929, we find that 86% of the variation is shared. Pretty high. Okay. So now we really do need to go on to the cast.
Anything that you want to ask about correlation before we, before we go on? I expected that to be a bit easier for you than some of the other stuff that we've done, because there aren't so many things to think about, there aren't so many things to check. Basically, all you need to know is what level of measurement of data you've got. I have, I have the impression that these correlation effects are can be very useful when you do a plant linguistics. I mean, if you're going to do to compare different groups in the way learners learn a particular topic, but perhaps they are not so much useful if you functionalize the text or the internal structure of the text or perhaps some variables, let's say, or categories, lexical items within the text. No, perhaps not. I mean, I, I, I suppose there are times when, when you could use it, but it's basically when you've got um, something that has values on two variables, and you want to know whether those values are related in any way. You might find examples uh, in that kind of work as well, but certainly it's, more, it's easier to see with things like groups of stores, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so the last test I want to look at in this group is, is the chi-square test. And as I said earlier, this is one of the tests that's perhaps the most frequent test actually, I think, in, in, in linguistic work. But often people don't apply it very correctly. And um, so we're going to be talking about the conditions for the use of the chi square test. Why have I left it till now? Well, it's because it actually deals with a different kind of data which we haven't dealt with so far. We haven't really said anything about normal data so far. And yet, a lot of the data that you, as um, people interested in language, will collect is of a nominal kind. Let's then remind ourselves of what nominal data means. It means that you can put your data into little boxes, into mutually exclusive categories. Right? It's either an X or it's an Y or it's a Z or whatever. So some examples of this is a particular verb, word, past tense or present tense. I know that's a, an oversimplification, but all that, you, know, you could add more tenses, but it can't be both past and present at the same time. You've got to put it into one box or the other. Now, I've deliberately put this one in to, as it were, upset the apple cart. Here's a particular speaker, aged less than 20 or more than 20. If I asked you what kind of a variable age was, what would you have told me? Is what? Interval. Interval. Yeah, uh, well, not, perhaps not just interval, perhaps ratio, because, you know, it, your age starts from when you're absolutely zero, doesn't it, when you're, when you're born, as it were. So strictly speaking, I suppose, it's ratio, but it's certainly on a scale with equal intervals. So what am I doing here, calling it nominal? Because you're speaking about more or less. Well, that, the more or less might even tend to make us think it was ordinal. Yeah. But what I've done is make two groups, isn't it? Yeah, more than Right, so, so I've said, is somebody aged more than 20 or less than 20? Now, there is a point that if they are exactly 20, then where do I put them? So I perhaps should have said less than or equal to 20 or more than 20. Right? But this is a, an important point. You, you're, you shouldn't think that your data necessarily are interval, ratio, ordinal, nominal, or whatever. It, it depends what you want to do with them. You create your variables. And you can perfectly well create an age variable like this, which is nominal. A particular person fits either into the under 20, under or equal to 20 category, or into the over 20 category, just as they fit into being male or female. So you're treating age here as if it were um, as, as a nominal variable. In some other work, you might want to treat it as a ratio variable. 
that's fine. As long as it's defined in appropriate ways. You could even treat age as an ordinal variable, couldn't you? You could um, arrange people, rank people in order of age. Right? In which case you'd be treating it ordinal. It's what you do with it, it's the way you want to see it for the purposes of your work that actually matters. Here's another example. Does a particular work, a novel or a short story or something, come from the author's early phase, middle phase or late phase, presumably, presuming that you can um, draw boundaries between those? You know, or if you're a musician, is it, is it early pre-1800 Beethoven or is it 1800 to wherever you put the boundary between middle and late? Uh, or is it a late string quartet or whatever? Okay, that again would be a nominal variable. Now, this is something where people so often go wrong that it's well worth taking a moment over it. For a chi-squared test to be valid, the data must be in the form of raw frequencies. I'm looking at a certain person. <laughs> You're not the only one. Most of us do it once or, once or twice in our lives if we use chi squares. No, I've, I've seen lots of examples where people who wanted to apply the chi square test, where they've applied it, and it looks perfectly reasonable to do it, but it isn't. They, they apply it either to percentages, right? So 55% of my data are so, such and such rather than there are 55 occurrences of this in my data. Or on normalized frequencies, like if you're doing corpus linguistics, you often express things as frequencies per thousand words, so that you can compare between texts. And of course, that's a very good thing to do for comparing between texts. You should do it. But you can't use those normalized values in a constant. You can very easily demonstrate that you get quite different results if you do this, compared with the results you get if you use the raw frequencies. So it only works with raw frequencies. Please don't forget that. It's, it's so important. It's tempting to you know, do a table of um, frequencies per thousand words, which you want in order to compare two texts or whatever, and then to use those data directly in a chi-square. Please resist that temptation. And another rather more subtle thing is that every observation in the data, every data point you have, must be independent of all the others. I think there's a later bullet point which deals with this in more detail, but I might as well say it now. Um, what do I mean by this? Well, let's say, for example, that you've got a repeated measures design. Now, there we know that um, two scores given by the same person are not independent. They're correlated because of the particular characteristics of that person. So if you've got a repeat of measures design, don't do a chi score. The data are not independent. If, in, if you've got large amounts of data that are contributed by one person and the rest of the people in your group have not contributed very much, for example, in a conversation, that you're trying to optimize. Again, that person's contributions are going to have particular qualities about them which are going to affect the outcome. And that person is making a, a disproportionate contribution to your data. You should be careful with using chi-squared there. And these are the kinds of things. I mean, I, I'm as guilty as anyone else. I've used chi-squared innumerable times and not really thought carefully enough about the question. It's something you hardly ever find discussed. So what's, what use is chi-squared? I've talked about what you must and must not do. The, the basis behind a chi-squared is that what you're trying to do is check how well some observed distribution, the observed distribution of your data, conforms to some hypothesized model. Now that's very, very kind of abstract, isn't it? But say you had, you developed, have you heard of um, 
put of Ziff, you know, Ziff's laws of um, the relationship between word length and word frequency, that, that they're supposed to be related inversely, aren't they? So small words are much more frequent than long words. Okay, now that's a math mathematical model. You know, he, he actually put forward a mathematical model there. And you could use chi-squared to check whether the distribution that you observe in a particular text or whatever is actually as it should be if the ZIF distribution formula is correct. It's for checking your data against some model. Right? However, in practice, what most of us use it for is as a test of association, of course, lack of association between variables. I'm going to give you a concrete example in just a minute. Well, what's our model then? What are we comparing our observed data with? Well, here comes the null hypothesis again. We're comparing our observed distribution of data with what we would expect if there were no relationship whatever between the variables we're looking at. The null hypothesis, as usual, is there is no relationship between, or there is no difference between. So we're trying here to compare the observed distribution that we found with what we would expect if the null hypothesis of no difference, no association, were true. And I'll try and show you how a document operates. So, let's take a textual example now. What we've done is we've counted the numbers of nouns, lexical verbs, and adjectives in samples of two texts by the same author. Yeah? Yes, I want to ask you a question about the chi-square test. Just yeah. thinking about intonation, for example, yes. and you want to carry out an experiment in which we want to uh, know whether the informants are able to decide whether a particular pitch inflection is a rise or a fall. Yes. Okay, so that they are categorically different. Okay, so you say, well, you run the test and uh, they are perfectly able to judge whether that is a rise or a fall. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, that's okay. Okay, but then you want to go further and you want to find out whether they are also able to perceive the difference between a low fall and a high fall. Yeah. Okay. Can you say that we can run the, the chi-square test because we are dealing, roughly speaking, with uh, um, raw frequencies? Because uh, since that is a matter of perception, we don't want to, uh, let's say, we don't want to fix a particular mathematical numerical value uh, from, uh, let's say, from, from where you can say that's a high a high fall or a low fall or a high rise or a low rise. Would I be right in that case to run the, the chi-square test? It, it all depends on what exactly you're trying to find out about these about the perceptions of high and low, high and, uh, low falls. Well, what, what do you want to know about that? Yeah, once I know, once I know that they, are, uh, they can judge yes. if something is a rise or a fall, yes. That's easy, fairly uh, easy. Sure. Then I want to know whether uh, they also perceive that they are non-native speakers of English, yes. for example, that a fall is a high fall or a low fall. Yes. And I am not fixing a particular numerical value uh, that I can decide from. No. So uh, can, I, can we say that we can run the chi-square test because we would be dealing with raw frequency, so would I be wrong? Well, I think actually the case in which you, you, you um, could use a chi squared, um, because if they've got to, to categorize the yeah. falls as either high or low, that's a nominal variable, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so something's either, in your classification, mm -hmm. they either have to say it's a high one or a low one. Right? Now, let's say, I'm not I'm sure this isn't what you're interested in, but let's say that you were interested in whether um, what, what language are you looking at? What? What language are you looking at? English. 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 Right, okay. Oops. Let's 
let's say that you um, were interested in So you had groups of French speakers and Spanish speakers. Right? And you could ask them to um, say whether things were high or low in particular cases. Then you could have numbers in these cells here. And then you could operate a chi-square test to see whether there was any tendency for French speakers to allocate more highs than, than Spanish speakers and so on. So I could see you know, cases where you could use a chi-square test. Yeah. It depends exactly what it is you want to find out. Okay. And I don't actually think that would be the thing, sort of thing that you would want to, to find out, because what you're interested in having yeah. is whether they accurately yeah. categorize them as high or low. Yeah, the thing is that the starting point is difficult because it's a matter of perception. Sure. Yeah, so you're, you're not fixing a particular numerical value and say, uh, above this value, that's a high fall, yeah. and below this value, that's yeah. a low fall. That's right. So what, what that shows is that the variable itself yeah. is nominal. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So if there's some kind of, if there's some other variable you want to to, in, to integrate with that, yeah. if there's some other variable whose relationship with that you want to check, yeah. then chi squared seems a reasonable way to do it. Okay, so now that Jeff mentioned different languages, so that, that, that might just be an example. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. okay, so in my example then, we've counted the numbers of nouns, lexical verbs, and adjectives. We obviously will have to have definitions of those that uh, allow us to, to categorize them in two takes by the same author, and that's what we get. Now, this kind of table, as I think I say in a, a later bullet point, um, is often called a contingency table. And it's got, it's a two dimensional table. So we're, we're looking at two variables here. One of them is which text are we looking at at a particular time? And the other one is what word class? So the table tells us that text one contains 60 nouns and 75 in text two, and so on down the table. Right. Could we do it with three texts as well? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, you can. You can do it with as many as you like, and as many word classes as you like. I think that's, you know, um, the bottom. Just one little thing. When you say we have counted the number of nouns, yeah. what does that exactly mean? Has the program counted them for you? No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that you do it this manually, manually. Or, or you might you, you might be able to do it with a, with a program that, that, that tags the words. I mean, there are programs that can tag texts. With the word classes. Sorry? There are corpora. Yes, there are corpora which are tagged, as you say. Yes, with word classes. Indeed. So you, you might do that manually, or you might do it on a tagged corpus, or you might get what's called a, 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 a tagger to tag your corpus and so on. Okay, so you see what we're doing, right? Now, what do we want to know? Well, we want to know whether there's any association between the text, which text we're looking at, and the proportion of the different word classes. So, let me go on for a minute. So we want to know whether there's any significant difference in the distribution of the three word classes between the two texts. Here's the answer to the question you've just asked. We can have any number of texts and we can have any number of word classes. So your table can have any number of rows and any number of columns. It just has to be a two-dimensional table with just two variables. And then, when we've done our chi-squared test, we can go on to identify particular associations between individual word classes 
and one of the two texts. So, for example, it might turn out, I'm not saying it will, it might turn out, <coughs> there are high numbers of verbs in text one and high numbers of adjectives in text two. We're looking for associations between word class and the text. Yeah? Okay. So what's the null hypothesis? Well, as usual, it's there is no whatever it is. In this case, there is no association between text and word class. In other words, there are even distributions of nouns, verbs, and adjectives in the two texts. The proportions of nouns, verbs, and adjectives in the two texts are the same as the null hypothesis. So how do we calculate the frequencies that we would expect if the null hypothesis were true? Because that's what we need. We're going to compare our observed frequencies with this model, which is the null hypothesis. How can we calculate how many of each of these word classes we'd expect in each text if there were no relationship at all between the text and the word class? Well, the first step along the way is to add to our contingency table the totals of the rows and the columns. So all I've done now is add to my table the row totals and the column totals and what we call the grand total, that is the 282, the total of everything. So we know now that there are 135 nouns altogether in both texts together. There are 63 verbs in both texts together. There are 84 adjectives. Furthermore, we know that there are, we've counted 125 words of these three kinds in text 1 and 157 in text 2. And that the total number of words we've classified is 282. All, all clear? All right, okay. So how can we use these row and column totals in calculating the expected frequencies under the null hypothesis. Right. This is a point at which people usually um, start to say, oh, this is just a bit of magic, and just pull the rabbit out of a hat or something. So um, let's see if you can follow this. I'm sure you will. We've got 135 nouns in total, haven't we? We know that from the figure in the noun row. And we know we've got 202, 282 words altogether of all three classes. Yeah? So we've got 135 nouns in the whole sample out of 282 words. So the proportion of nouns in the two texts as a whole is 135 over 282, which we could express as a decimal if we wanted. You all right so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if nouns are distributed equally between the texts, wouldn't we expect the same proportions of nouns in each of the two texts? Okay. But we know the total number of words in text one. 125. Yeah? So we know the number of nouns there should be. The same proportion as in the whole sample. Do you get it? That in the sample as a whole, all of it, 135 over 282 is the proportion of nouns. That should be the same for the two texts. So, we can apply that proportion to the total number of words in text 1, 125, to get the expected number of nouns, if there is no association between word class and text. So all we need to do is do that calculation, 135 over 282 times 125. And we can do that for each cell in the table. Now, you 
you see that that's what we've done. Let's go back to our table. In order to calculate the expected figure for any box in the table, any cell in the table, we take the row total times the column total and divide it by the total total, the grand total. Now sometimes people get a bit worried about this because what I've done is a bit of simple but not all that obvious algebraic manipulation, if you want, or arithmetic manipulation. So we said that the proportion of nouns was 135 over 282, right? And we said that that same proportion should apply to each text. And we know that there are 125 words in text 1. Right? So that's how many nouns we would expect to get. That's how we did it at first. That's the rationale I showed you, isn't it? But do you see that that's exactly the same as that? Instead of dividing 135 by 282, first of all, and then multiplying by 125, that's exactly the same as doing the multiplication first and then doing the division. <coughs> so this is row total times column total over grand total. Right? All we've done is manipulate it some. So there's a general way then of calculating the expected frequencies. which is that. Take the row total times the column total over the grand total. And that gives you the value of E, the expected frequency, for each cell. If the null hypothesis is true, if there is no association between the two variables. So E turns out to be 59.84. Now obviously you can't have 59.84 words but don't forget this is statistics. We, we need to be as accurate uh, here as this because otherwise we'll get um, false values of the statistic. So here's another version of the contingency table which is the same as the last one except that now in brackets I've put the expected frequency for each cell. And already you should be begin, beginning to see some patterns emerging here. Notice, for example, that the number of nouns in text 1 and in text 2, of course, is virtually identical to what you would expect from the null hypothesis. Nouns appear to be equally distributed between the texts. But verbs and adjectives are not. All right? So just from looking at the difference between the observed and expected frequencies, we can tell what the associations are. There seem to be more texts than you, uh, sorry, more verbs than you would expect in text one, and fewer in text two. And conversely, there are fewer adjectives in text one than you expect from the null hypothesis, and more in text two. So. We can say that verbs seem to go with text 1 more and adjectives with text 2. But we still don't know whether this is a significant effect, statistically speaking. We haven't yet calculated the value of the constant and the value of it. How do we do that? Fortunately, it's quite easy. Oh yes, I forgot to mention that the expected values, of course, have to add up to the same as the observed values. We've still only got so many uh, instances of the words to play with. Okay, so how do you calculate chi-square? That's the, the formula. 
So, for each cell in the table, like nouns in text 1, you take the value you've actually got, the value that you observe, the frequency of nouns in text 1, O. From that, you take away the expected value that you've just calculated on the basis of the null hypothesis, square the result, and divide by the expected value. So you do that for each cell, and then you add up all those values. And that gives you the value of Kaiser. So you can see, can't you, that the bigger the um, difference between observed and expected, the bigger chi-square is going to be, as you'd expect. Now this is a, another case where you need to know about the degrees of freedom for the test because that affects the critical value. And the number of degrees of freedom is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Now we had what's known as a three by two table. We had three columns. Did you have to say or multiplied? For the degree of freedom, the number of rows? The number of rows minus one multiplied by the right. number of columns minus one. Yes. Thank you. We've got three rows and two columns. So the number of degrees of freedom is two. And what the computer does for you, or what you would do manually if, if you were doing it the hard way, is check the value of chi-squared that you get, the test statistic, against tables that give the distribution of chi-squared for particular numbers of degrees of freedom. And as always, what the test statistic tells you is, or the associated um, probability, is what's the probability of getting the results you've obtained even if the null hypothesis is true? We've come across this so many times now that you should be beginning to expect it. That's what the test statistic and the associated probability value tell you. What's the chance of getting this distribution even if there is actually an even distribution, no difference at all in the populations from which you draw drawn the sample? So how do you do this in SPSS? Well, if you tried to do it the usual way, you'd be there for weeks, right? Because remember that SPSS normally requires each row to represent the data for one observation. But we've got 282 of the darn things. So it looks as if we need a table with 282 different entries saying things like this is a noun and this is text one. Yeah. Right? SPSS at least is kind enough to not to put you through all that trouble. There is a, a trick you can use. It would be really tedious to have to do that. So what we do is we set up a variable which contains the frequency of particular combinations like nouns in text 1, adjectives in text 2, and so on. Now, there are only going to be six of those. Yeah, two texts, three word classes. So you only need six rows in this case. And then we can click a button which says, weight cases. That means each combination is multiplied up by the frequency. So it, the system knows that if you say that the number of nouns in text 1 is 60, it's got to create 60 rows with that information, effectively. And so much easier, obviously, to do this way. So all you need is that. That's the input file. We set up a variable called text, one or two, and a variable called, I've called it W class, the word class. Notice that Variables in SPSS don't have to be numerical. And this, I think, may be the first time we've used a non-numerical one. They can also be string variables, as they're called, um, which allow you to insert words. 
And that's much better. I mean, if you can use a, a, a label that is transparent, that you can um, really understand, then it's better than calling it one, two, three, word class one, one, word class two, word class three, and so on. And it, SPSS often does allow you to attach labels to things. So that's the input file. We select from Analyze the Descriptive Statistics tab, which has something called cross tab, isn't it? That's, that stands for cross tabulation, cross tabulation of the data. And we tell it what the two variables are. And we say that we want to do a chi-squared test. We're also going to do something called Kramer's V. That's because this is what acts as an effect size for the chi-squared test. <coughs> and it's a good idea. There's an option under the cells tab in this procedure for seeing in your table that's output, both the observed and the expected frequencies. And that's a good idea to click that, because then you can compare the observed and expected frequencies and you can interpret the differences between them. So it's nice to have that in the output. So first of all, it gives you your contingency table with the observed count and the expected count. And it gives you the row and column totals. So this is really the table that I presented you with before. And our interpretation has to be that there are more verbs and fewer adjectives in text one than you would expect if there were no association. And the opposite way around for text two. That's why we need the expected counts here in the table as well as the observed count, so that we can compare the two and see that the two values agree almost exactly for nouns, but not for verbs and adjectives. Is that okay? See how it works? So nouns have exactly the distribution predicted. And here's the result of doing the chi-squared test itself. It actually gives you, again, more information than you actually need. There is another measure called the likelihood ratio, which you can use here. Uh, and it gives you that as well. But we'll concentrate on the um, Pearson chi-squared one. This guy, Pearson, was pretty prolific. Not only did he do uh, correlation coefficients, but also chi-squared. I guess it's the same person. So, the value of chi squared then. Um, it's, it's linked. It's linked. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on. Yeah. Yeah, it probably is the whole part of the whole yeah. image. So, we've got a, a Pearson chi squared, a chi squared of 5.74, DF2 as we calculated, row, number of rows minus 1 times number of columns minus 1, and the probability is 0.057. Oh, what a pity. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Just above 0.05. Again, I did this deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> to make a point. So, and notice the little um, explanatory note that he has put to us. And this is important. We're going on to it in a minute. No cells have expected counts less than five. That's an important thing, as we'll see in a minute. So, chi-squared is non-significant, but only just. Usual possibility. Try a bigger sample. You might get something that's just under 0.05. Yeah? Obviously worth going on. What about effect sizes? Well, I used Larson Ball's book for this, and she suggests, on the basis of a paper that she quotes, using this formula, uh, using the Kramer's V output from SPSS, and putting it in the formula V times the square root of R minus 1, 
where r is the number of rows or columns, whichever is smaller. Now we had three rows and two columns, didn't we? So r has to be two, the smaller of the values. Two minus one happens to be a convenient one, of which the square root is one. So uh, since there are two rows, w is the same as b, so it's 0.14. Now, we can interpret this in the same way as we can interpret the other effect sizes that we've calculated. Um, and you remember that point 0.1 is the boundary for a small effect size. So it's, it's only a, a small effect size, but appreciable. Okay, you all right so far then? Um, see what sorts of things can we do, we can do with um, chi-square. It's testing associations between variables, basically, where you've got frequency counts in each of the possible cells in the table. Raw frequency counts. Excuse me. Yeah. And um, what happens if the variable is not known? Like, let's say you have a Yeah, you could. But don't forget that, that this the test works with ratios. So, right? We because the, the, the numbers. If you look at your table, the numbers that we've got in each text are are different. Right? You're adding up and dividing. You're adding up and dividing. You're actually expressing this as proportions. So it doesn't matter that much. They don't, they don't have to be equal. I think it would be a bad idea to do it if they were really disastrously unequal. I mean, um, you know. If, if they were orders of magnitude difference, then uh, I don't think I would do it. But it is taken account of in the calculation of the expected frequency. So let's look at the limitations of the test, because these are all too often ignored. As that little note said to us, we need to test, we need to see whether any of the expected frequencies falls below 5. If it does, the test is unreliable. Right, so you shouldn't really um, accept the results of a chi-square test if any of your expected frequencies are less than five. Some texts, textbooks in statistics say it's okay provided that no more than 20% of your frequencies are uh, less than five. But particularly with small tables, um, it's, it's best to adopt the stricter criteria, uh, none of them below five which can be a, a severe limitation. If you've got low frequencies in some of your cells, then it's very likely that some of them will turn out to have expected frequencies of less than five. So what can you do? It's particularly important for two by two tables, small tables. Well, you may be able to combine frequencies for certain rows in the table, but only if this makes sense, if you're not adding apples to oranges, I mean, a good example is if you do a word frequency distribution for a text, what you find is that there are lots of words, there are quite a few words of length one, I'm talking about English now, but it might be different from other languages, quite a few of, of, of um, length one, but not all that many, things like I, uh, and so on, that are quite frequent. Quite a lot of length two, three, probably the the highest figure is going to be a 4 usually, and then it comes down again. And by the time you get to uh, something like... It goes like that, right? Frequency against, against number of letters in um, the word. And this usually turns out to be about 4. So by the time you've got to something like 12 or something like that, there are very few words left. And if you were to do a frequency table which had um, word length down the side and then frequency in, in the second column, you'd find there were lots of noughts and ones and things towards the end here. And it would be no good doing a chi-squared on that. So what you could do is to say, okay, I'm going to look at categories uh, one letter, two letters, three letters, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, then greater than eleven, or something like that. You could lump them all together at the end in the tail of the distribution. And that makes perfect sense. 
but it wouldn't make sense if you were adding two quite different categories together. So sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't. If you get that situation with different categories, it's often best just to leave those particular categories out of that particular analysis. Right? So just look at the ones that you can do. Another limitation is with two by two tables. That's two rows, two columns. And it can be shown that um, the normal chi-squared gives you a slightly false result there. You need to apply something called the Yates correction. SPSS will do this automatically. Um, and you can see that there's a slight alteration here to the formula. All it means is, do you remember what these bars mean? By the side, the modulus, it means ignore the sign. So we're only concerned with the size. So you take the difference between the observed and expected, but then you take a half off before you square it. That's the X correction. Just to emphasize this point that I made earlier on, that the points that contribute to each cell must be independent. So independent of those in other cells and independent of each other. And that, that means, as I said earlier, you shouldn't use the test if, for example, one particular informant provides an awful lot of the data in a particular cell. Because then the data points contributing to that cell are not independent. Or if you've got a repeated measures design. So you have to look at the design fairly carefully before you can decide what you can validly do a customer. Just a, a very brief word about log linear analysis. The limitation of chi squared is that it will only deal with two variables at a time. Right? So it's association between two variables. You, you can have as many values of those variables as you want, as many rows and columns as you want, but it has to be a two-dimensional table. Right? Now if you've got three or more variables, then you can do something which is an extension of chi-squared, but obviously rather more complex, called log-linear analysis. So if you think that the chi-squared philosophy, as it were, is, is applicable to your data, but you happen to have three or more variables, then it would pay to look at the possibility of doing a log linear analysis there. The aim of that analysis then would be to discover which variables or interactions of variables can explain the observed frequencies that you get. Okay. Now, I thought this might happen. We've come to the end of, of that. I did hope to be able to show you some stuff on the, um, the multi-dimensional scaling and clustering uh, things. We really haven't got time to do that in any detail. I mean, I, I guess we ought to go for lunch, did we, at 2.30 itself. Right. This, I thought this might happen because we've had some interesting question sessions and things like that as well. But do have a look at the, the output in your, in your text, because, in your handouts, because you may find that these um, techniques like clustering and multidimensional scaling are interesting for your particular work. Remember they're applicable where you've got a, quite a lot of data which are characterized according to quite a lot of variables when you're looking at patterns in the data. So I haven't had time, unfortunately, to, uh, to look at that, but you can see from the handouts the sort of thing that, um, that can be done. Okay, questions on the last part at all on chi square? Just before we finish. Yeah. Um, this question of, of independence yeah. with respect to corpus analysis. Yeah. Go on. Yes. Well, I mean, you obviously understand the question, but you probably could do that as well. Go on. But um, if you're looking at phenomena in, in the text, each um, later phenomenon 
um, may be influenced or, or even defined, as psychologists say, by earlier influences. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I, obviously, I'm not the person who thought of this, but um, there's been a lot of criticism of corpus uh, analysis for simply counting instances. Yeah. Um, without bearing in mind the fact that each instance you know, may well be dependent, and you just don't know, of course, that's whether right. it's true or not, that's on earlier right. instances. Strictly speaking, but that, that means we shouldn't be using a kind of statistics that's based on the normal assumptions of, of statistics, of, of independence, of randomization, and so on. Events in texts are not random. And this has been pointed out by quite a few people, and Adam Kelgariff, for example, has written interesting articles on this. And there are, uh, in or perhaps already developed, but being developed, other ways of looking at things which are not so dependent on these traditional types of statistical technique. And I think they're going to become much more important in the future. But there is a, a, a real question mark over whether we can apply standard um, statistical techniques to, to corporate and really be confident that we're getting results that we rely on. Yeah, everybody does it, you know, and some interesting things have come out of it. But there are these people who wave red flags around saying, yeah, but be careful because events in texts are not independent. Right? Texts are not random strings of words um, and are beginning now to, to develop techniques which you can get around that. But that's another course in another year's time, I would think. Probably quite a long one. Yes, that means we still do not have the proper statistics for the text analysis. We, we have some, but it's, it's, it's rather rarefied. And, uh, you know, not many people, perhaps, have been dealing with this kind of thing. But there are corpus linguists who are developing them, have developed um, techniques that are more suitable for that. I mean, log likelihood is, is something that has been used quite a bit in the number of log likelihood statistics. LL often. It's one of the things that, for example, if, if you're working with wordsmith tools, I think wordsmith tools gives you log likelihood as well as um, T, as well as Z, and I can't remember what it gives you now. I think log likelihood is one of them. Mutual information is um, But I'm sure Mike will be telling you about that in, in his seminar. It, it's, it's, it's an important area. It really is an important area. And we shouldn't be too complacent about it. Really. Yeah. Coming back to, <coughs> yeah. to the chi, to the chi, chi squares. Yeah. The final values, this is smaller than chi. Yeah. The base thing to do is to reject it, okay? And this means that you have to carry out the test again without this Oh yes, value. you have to do it again. You have to carry out the test again without that category. Okay. Right. So you can say, well, I this is the test. I forget about it. I don't use this in the analysis, although the, the, the figure is there. So no, you cannot no. comment on, no. You, have you, to should, carry you shouldn't again use the result. Out. Particularly if there are several, several cells that are less than five. Yeah. You know, but even if you've got one, strictly speaking, you shouldn't. But if you've got several, if they're often are, yeah, um, with less than five, then eliminate those categories and yeah. try your chi squared again just on the categories that give you enough for you to start. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do because you're looking at the distribution among categories, but you're just looking at fewer categories. So it's an okay thing to do. Unless you can combine cells in the way that I said you could for the word length distribution, for example. Then you can use all your data, but not as individual categories. Lumped together. Okay. I think you were going to ask something? Well, yes, but, but you can always create a variable which takes the frequency as as a single a single variable. It's it's in it's in the data tab 
of SPSS. Mm -hmm. So it's not so in the individual text. Like um, why would you want to do it there? But I don't think. No, I don't think you'd want to do it there. There are only certain circumstances where it would make sense to do that. But it's in the data tab. It's nothing to do with individual um, tests, which means you have to be very careful because you might then do another test straight after that and leave that option still on. In which case, it will, it will totally throw out all your results. Yes. Often you can manipulate your data in ways which present it different, differently, and then it will be suitable for a different kind of test. So there are often alternative ways, not alternative tests on the same data presented in the same way, although that is occasionally possible. But rather, yeah. Yes. Right. Well, if, 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 if you're going to do a t-test, do you need two columns of figures, as it were, two columns of score, or whatever, don't you? For each one for each of the each of the members of your sample. Right? Yes. Then you can do a t-test. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I see. You mean because you've got some entries which are at the same? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't use weight frequencies there. What, what I would what I would use is, is, is plain and simple cut and paste when you're doing when you're doing the data entry. Yeah. So if you've got lots of lots of things that belong to one text and that text is encoded as a one, then you can obviously use cut and paste to, to transfer that to all the cells that need it if they're particular if they're particular. But I don't I don't think I would use the data transformation the data pointing to Right, time for lunch. Thank you very much for...